All right. Good morning, everybody. Yeah. Thank you. What a wonderful morning, right? <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Uh, so I am Morris York. I'm director of library initiatives for the Big Ten Academic Alliance. Uh, and this morning, I'm going to talk to you about what we're building with the big collection. So a little over two years ago, I think, maybe it was two years, maybe it was 10, I don't know. Um, uh, I was at CNI with a number of our uh, library deans, and we were talking about uh, the vision for the big collection and kind of launching that off and what we're uh, foreseeing, what we're going to try to reach for, and things like that. And uh, today, I'm very pleased to be able to bring uh, uh, the next step in that. So we're just con uh, transitioning from that conceptualizing phase into the building phase. Um, and that building is going to begin like this winter, like maybe around February or something like that. Um, so I want to give you a little bit of order of conversation um, this morning. Uh, going to do a little bit about the Big Ten Academic Alliance, just a sketch, uh, some of our guiding principles and values. So that came through that conceptualizing phase, really important. You've got to be grounded in that. Uh, and then talk about especially uh, the sketch for what we're building and kind of like the high level of what that roadmap looks like. Uh, and then particularly in shared print uh, and open publishing. And I just got to say, as I go through this morning, I'm going to be talking about some of the pragmatic steps and tangible things and real things that we've got going. And I'm going to do a bunch of sketching of ideas, you know, because this thing is nothing if not dynamic and evolving. Uh, and I'm not shy at all about being, I don't know, here's some things we're thinking, <laughs> you know, and like that could change by January. And actually, you might be like, yeah, I'm not so sure about that, right? So um, in that sense, uh, it's definitely an invitation to conversation. Uh, and then I'm going to, as I go, weave in some of the early uh, insights that we're seeing in some of these areas. So I just want to start off uh, and touching back to observation Cliff was making yesterday about the general state of the world and things going on in our dear little globe. Uh, this quote from Ralph Waldo Emerson, so we are not permitted to stand as spectators of the pageant which the times exhibit. We are parties also and have a responsibility which is not to be declined. So that lies at the heart of what we're doing. This is a responsibility. We're not going to sit back. We are stepping forward to take our part. What does that part look like? That's what we're figuring out, right? That's what we get to learn. So here's the Big Ten Academic Alliance kind of on the map. Uh, if you follow sports at all, there's been some stuff about California and what happens. It's like mostly what that means for me is I really got to rethink how to do this. I don't get to use the map anymore. But for right now, uh, here's the map. And uh, of course, you'll know us as uh, uh, largely from our sports conference. But we had on the academic side have very little to do with them. We share a name and a logo, right? Uh, but 15 uh, R1s, and I'll give you a little bit of a picture of what we look like at the center. So BTAA, the Academic Alliance, we are our own company. We're a legal entity, 501c3. That means we can sign licenses, uh, we can sign contracts, we can hold agreements. This is all uh, important context for where I'm going to go with this. We can also own things. Right? We can own property. Uh, and to borrow a page uh, from Click and Clack, the company shutters every time I say it, but we can also be sued. <laughs> uh, this is very important, right? particularly when you get into contracts and agreements and trust, which sits at the heart of all this. Uh, so our growth model, the BTA has been around for 60 years. Uh, you may have known us formerly as the Committee on Institutional Cooperation a name which inspired no one. So, uh, but we've been here for 60 years and our philosophy, our DNA has always been stay small and light at the center. The main activity is in the member libraries. So when we take on something as massive as the, as the big collection, and I'm gonna characterize that, we gotta say, so what's the growth model, right? How do you scale? Because the Big Ten is about nothing if not scale, right? The problems aren't particularly unique. But the scale is fascinating, is very challenging. So here's our model, right? To successfully shift from this conceptualizing phase 
into building, we need a growth model. So we've got that core headquarters, and the way we scale on top of that, consultants, contractors, visiting program officers, secondments, uh, partners, right? This is a really rich ecosystem. Um, and you're going to see me talk about these different layers as I go through this morning. So just to start with the team, let me celebrate the team a little bit. So uh, here's what we think of as the core headquarters team. Myself, uh, Rob Van Rennes is the associate director. Marion Leon is our uh, assistant director for the big collection. And then Suzanne uh, Garrison is our community coordinator. Uh, our visiting folks, uh, just a fantastic team. So Mary Laskowski from the University of Illinois is our visiting lead for print stewardship, uh, and then we have three visiting program officers. Uh, Kate, Kate McCready, uh, visiting program officer for Academy on Publishing, uh, Chris Ellen Maloney, VPO for Trusted Infrastructure Services, and then we just announced last week uh, Carla Strieb from Ohio State coming on board as our visiting program officer for shared collections. So the other thing I'll do is I'm going through this at different points is I'll probably point to these folks, right, in the areas of activity. Um, that they're really taking up and uh, taking under their wing. So uh, also in the spirit of partnership, right, we are like reaching out. You're going to see me mention a lot of our uh, different partners and places where we're developing things and places where we've put in place agreements and other places where we're just germinating uh, and exploring and figuring out uh, how to do things. That, so here's our other wing of the library initiatives team, our consultants. Uh, another group of fantastic people. Um, these are five of our uh, consultants uh, that have been actively working on things in the last uh, few months for us. Um, so let's go to the big collection then. So I joined the Big Ten uh, probably a little over two years ago, right when uh, just a couple months after all the shutdowns were happening with the pandemic. Um, and I was given this job, right? This was what I was hired for. And uh, what the deans uh, had assembled was this tremendous vision for the big collection. So through collective action, and here's where the components, to unite the collections into one collection shared and fully networked, to unite the 15 separate collections into one collection. Increase the findability and usability of the total pool of content across the Big Ten, deepen interdependence, importantly, this was like fundamental. So this was not a cost savings measure, it wasn't an efficiency measure, it was a, this is the path to the future, right? And deepen our interdependence, optimizing for the whole before individual interests. So if you work in or are familiar with academic libraries at all, that is a profound statement. <laughs> really hard. Uh, so continually improve value at scale for our community. So this meaning this is not just about the libraries. At the center of this is faculty, students, researchers, authors, healthcare providers, right across our universities. This is an uh, enormous effort to sweep in uh, the needs at the whole, of the whole community and continually improve value. That's how we know if it's working, right? If you haven't improved things for people, Try something else, because it's not working. <laughs> right? So that layers in a whole new way of looking at our, our metrics and our value propositions and how we work. And finally, increasing resilience for an uncertain future for our universities. Boy, especially after the last few years, right? Tremendous uncertainty. And how do we face that through collective action and working together? Um, so let me give, uh, and, and here was kind of the commitment that laid a, at the heart of the big collection. Uh, so not just an agreement in spirit or a great idea, but actually implement the services, uh, the systems, and the policies necessary to create that networked collection. Make it real, make it pragmatic. I'm going to talk a lot about pragmatism this morning. Uh, and again, just in order to we always have this at the center, right? It's about the, our students our scholars supporting our mission, our common mission, maximizing access and ensuring preservation of the scholarly record. And I'll point to, a, you'll see a couple places as I'm talking where that last part really shows up pretty strongly. Um, so uh, one of our uh, consultants who 
works outside of the library space, was asking me at one point, as I said, so, so what's it going to look like? I mean, how big are we talking, right? I mean, on the scale of global collections, I was like, I don't know. Let me, let me look that up, you know? So that's what I found, <laughs> right? Third largest collection in the world after the Library of Congress and the British Library. Whoa. <laughs> All right, cool. <laughs> how often do you get a chance to make that, right? And how, how on earth do you think about doing something like that? So just to uh, dive a little bit deeper into that, the state of the print collection uh, for the Big Ten. Um, so we have distributed across this approximately 114 million items over the 15 research libraries. That's 22% of all the book, book titles, print book titles in North America. Interestingly, more than half of those are held by only a single BTA library. And I'll talk a little bit more about overlap and about what this looks like. And only 6% is duplicated in 10 or more BTA libraries. So this was a big insight for me, right? When I took the job, I was like, okay, cool, I got it, I got it. The question is, how do we create the big collection? Uh-uh. <laughs> the big collection has already been created, right? This is an incredibly coherent collection that has a 200-year history. And the question is, how do we step into this moment and pick it up, and where are we going to take it in the future? And to do that with intention. Um, this is fascinating, too. In 2017, almost 80% of expenditures were for license, not purchase content. So what does that mean <laughs> when you're creating for the future? Um, so that's a lot of cool stuff from the library perspective. But going to faculty, students, right, don't care that much. <laughs> So to take it from another perspective, when we talk about the big collection, imagine this brimming pool of every piece of print and digital content across all of our universities. And now imagine every student and faculty member with seamless discovery to delivery access to that pool. Uh, and I'm gonna talk about a bit about how we take this ideal and start to work it down into how do we make that real? How do we approach that? Um, the library deans gave us a tremendous gift just this last August as well, right? They put this extraordinary guiding star on top of this entire initiative, and it's worthy of just reading out, you know, in order to advance a just, trustworthy, scalable, and sustainable open knowledge ecosystem, make open, more equitable scholarship our lead purpose. That's what we're here for, right? How wonderful, right? Just to come in a job and be like, okay, hey, so actually your main thing is justice. Your main thing is equitable scholarship. Your main thing is open. Make everything about that. Absolutely. That makes it even richer, right? So what became apparent as well as we're, as we're crafting this vision for the big collection was it's far more than that. You know, it's far more than about stuff, <laughs> you know. We were creating a knowledge commons. That's what we're engaged in, creating a knowledge commons for the Big Ten. So we got to put our ideals up there, of course. Make it findable and usable, access to that total pool of knowledge across the Big Ten, make it open and just public knowledge for the public good, make it durable and trustworthy. So from past generations to future scholars, and of course, libraries love this. <laughs> this is where we live. Uh, and also inclusive and collaborative, vested in the community. This is not a top-down initiative. <laughs> Nobody is issuing orders. This is not a command structure, right? Vested in the community and arising from the community. Uh, the community of staff across Big Ten libraries is about 2,500. Uh, the community of students, faculty, our broad community is over 600,000. So this is an incredibly important thing for us to say, vested in the community. And I mentioned pragmatism to take this approach. Build it right, build it to last, make it work. Very simple. Right. Um, so we say how we start turning these ideals into something we can create. How do you do that? Um, 
So we've adopted the innovation model, right? Rather than distribute a lot of tasks between a lot of committees, say who's gonna build what and things like that, the innovation model says, well, we don't know what's gonna work. So make small investments, right? It's that fail fast, learn model. Put forward a little risk and innovation, you know, consolidate the gains from that, keep what works, turn it into your practices and habits and throw out what doesn't work. You don't need it, right? You could probably learn a lot, but you don't need it. Get rid of it. Once you consolidate those gains, put forward a little more risk, you know, consolidate the gains, a little more risk, and you start to get this dynamic as you move, it moves in a spiral fashion, right? Um, so uh, taking that into a project structure, it started to look a little bit like this. The pilots, right, is where we make those small investments, that's those seed resources, try something out. I'm gonna talk about a few of our pilot projects that we've got going. When you find the ones that work, you turn those into projects. That's where we need to build resources, right? Take it to scale, make it big, make it big 10 scale. Uh, and finally, when it reaches that point, they become our programs, you know? They sustain resources, just run at scale, it's core infrastructure, where nobody asks, right? It's just like, nobody asks, hey, should we be part of Hathi Trust this year, you know? Nope, <laughs> it's just what we do. Should we lend books? Do we have a you borrow lending? It's not a question, you know, you just do it. Um, so, the big collection is so massive, it's so huge, no one can understand it, right? no one can even conceive of what it takes. So what do we do when we have something that's too big to understand? Break it down into smaller pieces, right? So we started calling these the mile markers. Mile one, mile two, mile three, mile two and three, I'm not really sure what those signs say yet, they're kind of out there. Let's focus everything we've got on that first mile marker, though, because we can see that, right? Any content from anywhere to anyone now and in the future. So we've got to layer in some really uh, important and rich preservation aspects uh, to this. It's got a lot of dimensions. Um, so here's what it kind of looks like, right? That first mile marker. What we're building, fundamentally, is interoperable systems of trust. Because we don't know exactly what those future mile markers are, but we know where we've got to start is with trust. And that's those interoperable systems. So implement the infrastructure services, standards, and agreements necessary to make that happen. Uh, so we're using the kind of a shorthand phrase of a systems of trust. It doesn't explain itself, but I'll explain it <laughs> as, a little, as we go in. But those systems of trust... Uh, the fundamental model is what's the infrastructure services we can run at the core that enable all of this work in the member libraries to happen. Um, so that shows up in print collections and open publishing first and foremost. That's what I'll talk about primarily this morning. That's where we're doing a lot of work. Um, the other place it shows up is in digital collections. That one sits off on the, just on the horizon a little bit. We can see it there. We haven't quite picked it up, but we know it's there. It's the third component of this. Uh, the things that unite these three domains, robust digitization network, so that's only, you know, only about half of the BTA print collections are actually digitized. There's a huge amount there to go, right? So, uh, and, it, and it happens to be, ah, the research stuff, rare, unique, distinctive, right? So that robust digitization network connecting the print collection realm to the digital collections, uh, automated deposit, I'll talk about that a little bit, uh, connecting the open pub uh, the publishing realm to digital collections as well, and repositories. The how will work is fundamental. How are we gonna do that? Through collective action, right? A robust, structured, aligned network. Uh, and we have an incredible network. So I described the 2,500 staff across all the libraries, uh, we have probably somewhere between 350, 400 of those are engaged in various aspects of our peer groups and projects and things like that. We have a huge network. Um, and then imp just so importantly, who will be as we do this, right? Centered in diversity, equity, inclusion, accessibility, and with a particular emphasis on adamant, intentional anti-racism. And this is where we pick up, it's like changing the policies and the workflows. You know, sort of, the, they call it systemic racism because it's embedded in the systems. So change the systems. 
Um, so I'm talking about the blue bubbles across the top. These other realms are like entire talks in and of themselves. So I'm going to focus on that, what we're building part. Um, so first of all, just that systems of trust for print collections uh, and what that starts to look like. Um, so our shared print repository, all right, let's pick up very, some very practical things, you know. Uh, we had two phases of it already. They're in uh, two physical repositories. They're at the University of Illinois and at Indiana University. So this has been 10 years, 2012 to 2022. We did it in two phases. It was print journals, right, uh, commonly held materials. It's about 450,000 volumes. Uh, in those two repositories, headed towards 500. We're going to get there. We've got to go towards tens of millions, and it took us 10 years to get there, right? But it was awesome because over 10 years, we learned about how to operationalize things like selection, validation, collocation, conditions of storage, right, levels of service, all that kind of stuff. So we have a huge amount of learning, and now we've got to take it to radical scale. So how are we going to do that? Um, so the first thing is we are uh, right now actively converting that um, project into a program. So that sketch that I drew out there, when you prove something out, even if it's a 10-year project and it works, take it to scale. Um, so in this model, we're talking about a distributed network of shared holding capacity, no longer centralized repositories, uh, federated management, right? Many of us join together for a common purpose. We expand to monographs now, so we're not just in the serials realm. And the goal now is to scale rapidly, scale to millions of titles from where we are at a few hundred thousand. Uh, and while we're doing that, balance preservation and access and provide equitable access to that total pool of content. You know, so I'm talking a lot about print. Of course, we're in systems of trust for print. Uh, this is what it looks like in the print realm. When we get to the digital collections realm, it's going to look a little different. We're going to be doing some different things. But the first thing we've got to take care of um, is that responsibility to the print collection that we've built. Um, so when we think about how to build a collective collection, and there's a lot of really bright people, a lot of great organizations working on this, um, and to a lot of extent, like, like we borrow, we pick up, we do a little thinking in our own context, what do we got to do? So this is very much just like what it kind of looks like for us, right? So this is a bit reductive, but if we look at it at super high level, there's like three options uh, for how to approach building a shared collection at this scale. Uh, everybody implement the same ILS. Right? There are consortia that do that really well, <laughs> you know, really works. It's not going to happen for the Big Ten. It's just not. <laughs> I mean, we have like five different ILSs. These are R1. They're enormous universities. We're never going to say, hey, everybody move now. And you know where we're going now. Let's move to the next ILS. We need something different. Model B, run middleware to glue together diverse systems. So there's one consortia doing this that we know of that's doing this effectively and has been doing it a long time at scale. Um, and that's the RECAP consortium uh, out east. So um, Harvard, uh, Columbia, Columbia, NYPL, and Princeton. Um, so you'll see me talk a little bit about our pilot there. This, so this, we, we gravitated towards this and said, wow. We gotta test that out. <laughs> we gotta try it. We got, a, we got a pretty different use case, right? We're distributed across half the continent, but that's the one trying it. So let's go investigate that. So we got an active pilot there uh, to look at that software. Model C, working with what you have and using features of existing software. So I come out of library IT. <laughs> I spent like 15 years there. Uh, I've, um, Worked in that world for a long time, and it takes a long, long time to get lots of different vendors, open source systems, things like that, all moving in step to try to integrate and deliver services. So it's like, that's possible, right? That could happen. It's a long road, <laughs> but it's there, right? So we're going to try that Model B and see if we can uh, make that work. So. Uh, 
a little worried about our shared print program is how we're approaching it um, is really like, so that common infrastructure layer, that's where we're at right now. Uh, operational agreements, policies, things like that, that realm, uh, those are kind of BTAA central. That's what we focus on. Uh, building interdependent services on top of all of that. Uh, so the member libraries, especially active in the operational agreements and interdependent services. So we got, what we got to do is build that common infrastructure layer underneath. So these are our questions, right? So what do we hold? <laughs> like, what do we have, you know? Uh, so we're um, starting up some work with uh, Gold Rush from the Colorado Alliance uh, to look at that question. Let's gather that 114 million things and throw it in one pot and see what happens. <laughs> probably a lot of it doesn't match up. <laughs> you know, it's probably a big mess, but let's start and see what we got in there. Um, how does it move, right? So what are those flows? You know, and this is where we're especially looking at uh, borrowing infrastructure. Uh, and we have a pilot in fulfillment analytics. How can we look at the data we're generating? Um, OCLC has uh, been a, a huge part of our uh, uBorrow program, our uh, joint lending program across everyone for about 10 years. Um, and we're looking forward to uh, seeing some announcements there pretty soon about what the future of that looks like. Um, we're also working with a, a company program called My Library Dashboard, originally developed at Wayne State. Um, they joined up with Google. It's a Google company now, um, built on top of Looker Analytics infrastructure. So we're going to throw a lot of data into that and see what we can learn um, at scale. And then what technical infrastructure do we need for this? Uh, so I mentioned Recap and the SCSI B software. So we've got an active uh, pilot going there. Uh, HTC is the software developer for that. Um, we're going into uh, a relationship with HTC to have them spin up a sandbox for us where we can test this out, right? Through a bunch of records, uh, our records into it, see how it matches up to the use case we need, see where it breaks, see where it doesn't, um, and see what kind of a match we've got there. Uh, and then this one is really tough, right? How do we incentivize retention and access commitments? Why would people, why would libraries commit, you know, volumes to this? What would they be committing? How would you even incentivize that? Um, so here we're working with a, an accounting firm, um, Martin Hood, to help us do cost modeling on some different options for what that could look like. Uh, and for particularly how you create a cost model for incentivizing uh, contributions and taking that to scale very fast, you know. At the, and we know we can't, fully compensate for retention, it's too much, right? I mean, it's like <laughs> uh, Paul Courant um, and uh, some others that had an article where the cost of storing a book and it was like dollars and dollars, or that's too much, <laughs> too expensive, nobody would ever do it. So how do we build a model like that? Um, so a little bit of example of this, like this prag pragmatism and how that shows up. Uh, so, just a little bit of a use case right here in the example, this number of copies question. Uh, so, consider, if we will, this question that comes up often in shared print and collective collections, right? How many copies should we keep? What's the ideal number? <laughs> you know, how far should they be distributed? Is it, is it three? Is it four? I, you know, it's a really hard problem. Uh, and there's a lot of really good people working in that space. So it was like, we'll try that an approach here. How many copies do we have? You know, where are they? What condition are they in? What are they, where are they stored, right? What conditions are they stored in? And what's our combined distributed holding capacity when we look across all 15 libraries? Um, this allows us to do, let's, let's look again how that learning approach shows up, right? Instead of a conversation about how many copies is the right number to keep, this question about how many do we have, right? So if we have 10 and it's commonly held, well, that's one thing. Are we not so concerned about that level? Do we, there's seven circulating and three that are protected, whatever it is. 
When it becomes infrequently held and there's only five copies left, do we heighten our attention and say, well, wait a second, you know, gotta make sure a couple of those are dark and in really good preservation quality and things like that. And we get down to only two, or wow, the last copy left, right? A lot of conversation about what you do when you have the last copy left. Are we making sure that there's a digital surrogate of that, right? Are we making sure nobody ever touches the physical thing? What do we do? So that we're sort of developing a matrix of these interventions uh, and how we treat that. Uh, I said I'd be talking about things very much in development. We don't know what that looks like yet, <laughs> right? So we're working on that. Um, but this leads to this really interesting question of like what does real-time network intelligence at scale look like across uh, this scale of holdings, this scale of flows and stocks. Um, and I won't spend too much time uh, on this one, but this was just a, like a conceptual mock-up. Uh, you know, so I call it the big weather map, completely lifted from the world of uh, networking, like IT networking and network intelligence, <laughs> where you create a map, weather map of your network and what are the bottlenecks, what are the flows, where are things not working, what's the bandwidth of the pipes and things like that. So we can be able to understand and have an insight into uh, this infrastructure and how are we doing on converting and moving the um, uh, stewardship dial you know, from ownership uh, to access. How, what does the network cost look like? You know, how is that working? What's the net network efficiency? Um, and if we want to look at things like our stocks, you know, our flows, be able to have like switches and knobs to turn this on, and also be able to look back at the time scale. Uh, so I want to look at today, I want to see how we're doing 6, 12, 18, 24 months ago, and what did all of that look like. So we did a little exploratory uh, overlap analysis here in network intel intelligence. Look across four BTA libraries, that was 22 and a half million BIB records, right? 3.4 million of those um, were multi-institution, held at more than one institution. Uh, three and a half million of those uh, were multiples. So that's only a 19% overlap between four institutions. Right. Uh, it's important, what do we do about that 19%? <laughs> we would probably like gain some scaled efficiencies, some cost savings and things like that, but it's not why we're doing it, right? The other 81, is why we're doing it. Um, so here we're leaning in and like co-designing, a, a, starting with this research project with uh, OCLC Research and say, what, so what can we learn, right? What's the data-driven network intelligence we can gather at scale? And how do you use that? So how do we build this learning model, data-driven at scale, and start to say, what do we have, what's going on, and how do we want to change that picture, right? What are the strategies that we can put in place? So I'll just walk around a little bit then, and when we start to put all the pieces of the picture together, right, back to the systems of trust concept, what does that look like? So uh, we'll put up the libraries uh, on the left there. I'm not gonna draw 15 libraries. So there's four, but there's 15, right? Uh, that cloud around it is our uBorrow, that's our delivery backbone that exists today. That's what we've been running. Uh, for 10 years um, on top of uh, Relay uh, D to D from OCLC. Uh, put SCSI B on the other side, which is where we're testing that out, you know, looking at that, particularly for things like uh, matching algorithm, commitments registry, right, patron direct fulfillment, how do we do all of those things? Um, so to try and uh, start to sketch this out a little bit, and, and I'll put in some tiles here that are kind of some of the pilots that we have going. Um, so over here, we had four different pilots going uh, for the borrowing infrastructure and the saying, like, what's the future of it, right? How should we refresh the platform? What does that look like? Um, and then I got a little project tile up there on SCSI B, you mentioned that. It was like we're in a, you know, actively testing that. So how does it all fit together? So let's picture in the middle of that a data lake, right? Of the bib records, items, holdings, transactional logs, everything we can get our hands on from all institutions. Just dump all of that into a data lake that then we can mm -hmm. operate on uh, and work with. So this subset of that, so our total holdings are not the big collection. The big collection is 
uh, the shared collection is the things that we've made commitments to, <laughs> you know, for retention and access, and we're kind of following that uh, uniform agreement. Um, so it, let's take a subset of that right now, literally 450, 500,000 items, you know, and it's gonna grow, it's like ripples in that pond, you know, so next year, can we add another million, three million the year after that, how do we grow and scale? We take that, um, the orange piece is completely imaginary right now, but some kind of extract, transform, load service that can sit there and take all of those on behalf of everyone, throw it into a format that uh, SCSI B likes and load it in there. Um, and into that MOU for the shared collection, those commitments are, right, just flag the record, right, please see the MOU. <laughs> That's where the agreements are. Um, and then we also want to add in real-time availability. So we got to know where this stuff is, can you get it, right, Out, down to the second. <laughs> so some kind of service sitting there constantly pinging and finding that information, uh, throwing it back to the shared index. And then uh, the brilliant thing SCSI B does is just serialize that, send it back out to the member libraries, and then it's up to each individual library to integrate that into their local services, uh, into their local technology stack, everything else like that. So again, this running a central infrastructure service at the core, this te technology agnostic, future agnostic, <laughs> just there to be dependable and running as that system of trust. Um, put the big weather map down in the corner there. That's just watching the data lake, <laughs> right? What's happening in there? So I can get a visualization of that. Uh, and then this last piece is very important. Oh, it's like, how do we start? This is an idea that came out of the community. We're talking about vested in the community an inclusive metadata registry. So what are we gonna do when we come across like things in the realm of subject headings where there are a lot of um, harmful, uh, objectionable, <laughs> uh, you know, metadata that we just don't want? Why would you ever call anybody illegal? What's an illegal person? That doesn't make any sense. So let's have a different term for that and creating a registry that's shared, uh, a shared practice across all of our libraries for how to do that. We have a lot of individual efforts why don't we join that together uh, and make a shared registry? Um, so I'll quickly just move through, uh, that, that's what we're doing in print collections, uh, quickly move through open publishing and a few of the things that we're doing there because um, we've had quite a lot going on. So I'll start just with the BTA, uh, our consortial licensing portfolio, okay? So, Okay, here's an example of where I say things, and some of them are like, no, not really, <laughs> right? But in general, at a high level, right, there are a lot of consortial buying clubs out there, you know, where we join together historically to all get the best price on something. BTA is no different, you know. We created a consortial pool of joint licensing agreements for people to get the best deal possible. And this is what our portfolio looks like. It's kind of compact, actually. It's kind of nice. $54 million portfolio. Uh, what you see in the orange there are the places where we have less than 11 members participating in that contract. Blue is more than 11 members. So it's kind of a nice portfolio. Actually, most of it is dedicated to like what we have as our definition of collective action, which is 11 or more institutions working together. Um, so what do we do with that, right? So our direction, if we go back to that ideal, that I placed at the top, make this, put at the center, increasing, advancing, open, equitable scholarship. So what that means in the licensing portfolio is a, defines a direction for us. So to flip that buying club, get the best price, to move toward open publishing, which has a whole different, you don't set aside cost savings, right? But you add a lot of other metrics for measuring, are we advancing open knowledge? How are we doing? Are we making things better? So what that looks like by license count, this is, this is kind of interesting. This was like as of September, <laughs> right? So there are like close to 40 licenses uh, in that pool. Only five of them were actually open at the beginning of September. Uh, one of them we were negotiating, another one we'd gotten an offer, five of them we were kind of looking at. So like you look at the blue, you're like, oh, this is good progress, but what about that huge swath of blue? You got a long way to go <laughs> to flip that portfolio. So we said, well, turn it around. We'll just look at it by dollar value, right? So this is as of today. 
right? So already open at the beginning of 22, about uh, 4%. So we just announced an open publishing agreement with the Institute of Physics, unlimited publishing, no APCs, right? That was just like last week or the week before. It's another about less than 4% of the portfolio. 32% um, of it is Wiley. And we're just wrapping up that negotiation. We should have an announcement about that actually like within weeks. Um, $16 million. Another 35% of it is Sage and Springer Nature. So we're renegotiating those contracts next year, All right? Uh, and then we got 25% of it that's, you know, traditional subscription products. Right now, there's not really an open access path. Uh, so to flip this portfolio, we're really looking at a handful of major agreements and we'll be there. And now we can have that as the central purpose, right? So um, what does that look like? A model for open publishing agreements, like what are we doing? So you know, what do we go into that looking for? Um, and this is where we're just doing a lot of exploring and learning and trying to figure it out. How do we put this together, you know? But the fundamental approach that says, we are equal partners investing in a transitional change with our publishers, with our vendors, whose outcome is uncertain. Nobody knows what it looks like on the other side. And as such, we should be, we are investment partners, and we should share the risk equitably. All the risk doesn't sit in the libraries. <laughs> this is just as much a risk on the business model side for the publishers. So let's join together in that and share the risk. And what does that look like? So the pragmatic approach again, like remove friction from the system. Remove friction from the system. Um, so for us, right, this, this becomes is like how we manifest this in the things that we want to see, right? All open access, all journals, right? Get rid of the colors of OA. I don't, I don't come from this space. I come from the technology space. That was like gold, green, hybrid, purple. I, there's a lot to understand, and it's not that it's not important. <laughs> That all exists for a really good reason, and people really know that stuff, right, and really good at it. So, okay, for us, how about we just get rid of the colors of OA? Because the faculty are not getting it. <laughs> you know, it's not working for them. Let's dispense with it. No fees for authors, no caps, no limits, no hassle. Non-APC based. We'll just take that off the table. We're not even play in that world anymore. And what does that look like? Authors keep rights in their own works immediately available and open to the public. So now we're touching back, we're starting to make a little progress on that public knowledge for the public good. Uh, libraries pay no more than they do now. That means we're converting our spend to publishing. Right? We don't pay extra for this. Um, all workflow and labor to be handled by the publisher. So it, just as it cannot be an increase on our financial resources, because we don't have them, it also cannot come as an increase on our people, because we don't have them either, <laughs> you know? Um, and also, to make sure that we're engaging in structured, meaningful, contractual, make sure it's in the contract. Um, conversations about DEI and editing and publishing and stewardship of the scholarly record. Um, so another place we're active, that's what it looks like in the journal space, uh, in eBooks and opening the scholarly monograph. Um, so this is a collaboration of six Big Ten presses and libraries. It's a pilot we have going. Uh, open, open, open model, right? So it take 100 books previously published in Big Ten presses across six presses uh, that have never seen electronic form, convert them to electronic, uh, host it on open platform, so using uh, Fulcrum and Manifold infrastructure underneath that, uh, distributed in open j channels through JSTOR and Project Muse. So the bulk of the funding of this comes from Big Ten libraries uh, to create this collaboration and also uh, supported in part by the Mellon Foundation. Uh, this is a one-year project expecting to see the first uh, the uh, results of this. Is like try it out, you know, see if it works. Like next May, June, about then. So we'll have more on that. Um, and then I'll just do this real quickly because I gotta wrap up. Um, our, this is all part of an open scholarship strategy that we have across. Uh, our, uh, our portfolio of many places we're working. So balancing the journal marketplace 
studying and understanding the landscape, that data-driven network intelligence at scale, what can we learn? The logos on here, by the way, are, are uh, companies, partners, uh, organizations where we've uh, made deals for, in, in the collective action sense, the whole Big Ten and Academic Alliance working. Uh, elevating marginalized and unheard voices and opening the scholarly monograph, uh, strengthening academy-owned infrastructure, uh, and building a portfolio of sustainable open content and open infrastructure. So as you see us making announcements and working in these spaces, this is the strategy that we're working with. So this is huge, right? So I'll just leave <laughs> with this statement. Make no little plans. This is my dad said this. Uh, all, I have three brothers all growing up together. Like, make no small plans, boys, no small plans. Uh, turned out I learned that was actually a quote from Daniel Burnham, right? Make no little plans. They have no magic to stir the blood and probably themselves will not be realized. Make big plans. Aim high in hope and work, remembering that a noble logical diagram once recorded will never die, but long after we are gone, be a living thing asserting itself with ever-growing insistency. So that's what we're doing with the big collection. Thank you very much. Thank you.